Hey, here we are. I am uh, had a little glitch there at the end, so if you can hear me and uh, see me, just post something on the Q&A and let us hear me. I have a lot of familiar faces in the room right now. Uh, let me make a couple of switches real quick to get a fish started. Okay. I think we should be going now. So if you can in here and just let me know something in the, uh, in the uh, just pop something in the quick mark. Okay, a little glue. Let's stick with me for going to make a couple of changes and see if it works. All right. While we're at, I can do. I mean, how to do this if it's a little glitchy. I'm going to turn my camera off. Hang on. Stay with me. It's always a technical issue. I'm still here if you can hear me. Like I said, I'm just trying to work out a couple things real fast. About 30 more seconds, I'll be ready to go. Okay, still work. I've got a little issue here. If you can still hear me, still working on a couple things. So, uh, bear with me, we'll get this worked out in no time. So, okay, you know, what I'm going to do is turn my camera off and leave the audio on. Tell me if you can see the screen and let me know if you can hear my audio on. I think I got it worked out. So if you can, if you're still hearing me and, and uh, you can't see me, but listen to my audio and see if you can tell me if you can see the screen, I think I got everything worked out. So we'll go ahead and get started from there. Just if you could uh, type in something real fast. Okay, I'm here now. Audio is good.
Okay. All right, so you can see the screen. I think we're good now. All right, just a little setting that wasn't working exactly right on this end, so I think I've got it going now. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. It looks like there's a little bit of lag time. Usually I do these from my home office in Texas and we go without a glitch, but now uh, uh, I'm actually in Bozeman, Montana. We're right on the eve of kicking off a winter in Yellowstone trip. Uh, that trip actually kicks off this evening with our guest orientation. I'm in the conference room right now at the hotel kind of going through this, uh, about to go through this, managing your digital photo collection. This is actually a reschedule from about a month ago when we had uh, more glitches then. You would think that, you know, I, I do I do 20 of these webinars, 20 or more of these webinars a year, I think, and they all go with, off without a hitch. But when we go to managing your digital photo collection, it always seems like we have some issues there. So uh, I apologize for that. Like I said, from everybody's comments, I think we've got everything going the way we need it to go now. I'll just broadcast today without you seeing my my face on the screen, which that'll make it a more enjoyable experience for you. Uh, that way it'll say bandwidth. I did all the pre-checks before everything started, but if you ever use technology before, you know things don't always work like you hope they might. And uh, But as long as we can kind of get through it, we'll go, we'll go from here. So again, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody for being here. Uh, while I was still trying to, uh, yeah, Michael says must be the topic. The God, the gods don't want me to share this info. It must be. I don't know what the problem is because again, every every one of these things I do goes off without a hitch, and then all of a sudden, when I did this the first time, we had a bunch of issues, and now I'm doing it again. We're, we started off with a few issues, but I think we got them worked out. So we're gonna, I'm gonna knock on wood and keep my fingers crossed that we can get through this thing, and. Uh, I'm going to try to do this in a couple of ways. I'm going to go through the slides first. And then uh, just because I'm a little spooked on the technology, I'm going to try at the end to maybe share my screen with you and show you a few Lightroom techniques and what you can do. But really this, what I'm going to talk about today works with Lightroom or it works with a uh, uh, bridge or any other kind of photo management program that you may use. And it's really, it's more of a mindset than any, any particular thing. I mean, me personally, I use Lightroom. Uh, I was an early adopter of Lightroom when it first came out. When uh, when digital photography and image management became a thing, Apple had a program called Aperture. Lightroom had a, I mean, uh, Adobe came out with a program called Lightroom. And really both of those programs are kind of the same. They allowed you to do some image manipulation, but it's also at its core kind of an image management, just allowed you to to manage your digital assets and, and catalog them in a way that you could find them later on. Uh, and so with, uh, with that said, the reason why I went with Lightroom instead of Aperture is one simple reason. I already had kind of a file system set up on how I find my images, and I'll share that with you later on today. Uh, and I could, I could import that file system into Lightroom, but at the time with, with Aperture, I couldn't do that. Aperture is no longer a program, and so I've been using Lightroom for a long time, and that's what I use, and that's what I'm comfortable with. Lightroom, like any software program does have its drawbacks but again the the what i'm going to talk about today is not lightroom specific it's more just kind of a general uh it's more of just a general management uh it's more of a general image management topic so with that said today's topic is managing your digital collection i think uh Steve asks, is there a problem because I'm not getting audio? Steve, I've had other people report they are getting audio, so I think it's coming through. You might just check your speakers. So uh, with that said, let's go ahead and get started. And well, again, we may have a little bit of a lag time. I'm going to try to eliminate that. But again, my name is Russell Graves. Uh, I am in Dodge City, Texas, or I'm from Dodge City, Texas, which is in Northeast Texas. But again, today I'm coming to you from Bozeman, Montana, on the eve of a, uh, of a backcountry journeys trip. And so really, what's the key to managing your digital collection? And by the way, before I get really far into this, I want everybody to know that on these presentations I do, I want this to be a, a dialogue and, and not a monologue. And so if you have any questions for me as we go along, just feel free to just pop them in there and I'll answer them as best I can as we go along. And so... Uh, so with that said... 
What's the key to managing your digital photo collection? If you're in any kind of business that requires processes, all everything from manufacturing an item to some kind of office process all requires the exact same thing that managing your digital photo collection requires. And that's efficiency and consistency. And those are the two big things. Because here's what I found out, and this is anecdotal, nothing scientific about this. But I found out over time and me being involved in photography and I've been doing photography for a long time. Uh, I've been teaching photography, at least informally for a long time and more formally for the past four or five years. Uh, and the one thing I found out is people love to take images, but it's a lot of times they kind of fall short when they figure out when they get them back home and figure out, OK, what do I do with them or how do I find them later or how do I manage this whole monster library that I've got and how do I how do I just find something later on? I mean, there's all these questions. They, they, they love taking pictures and they learn that part of it, but they, they skip what I consider one of the most important parts and that's managing the library. And so I'll tell you my story for uh, real fast. Uh, I have about 620,000 images in my photography library and I can call my wife right now. And this isn't a, this isn't a, a slight against her because she's got her own things to keep up with, but she doesn't know where I keep my images in my library, but I could call her up right now and find any one of 620,000 images. I could call her and direct her through the steps on the phone and she could find any image in my library in about two minutes, probably. If I'm doing it myself, I can find any image in my library in about 30 seconds. And so that whole process and being able to find these pictures starts with this in mind, efficiency and consistency. So I've, in this presentation, I'm going to talk about ways to kind of get from point A to point B the quickest. But the main thing is, and that's where I think a lot of people fall short, is the consens con consistency part. Now, what I'm going to talk about today, I am not saying that this is the absolute best way to do it. It's just my way of doing it. And so if you've got some strategies that you employ that you like that works for you, I'd like to hear those as well, because I'm always open to learning new things. Uh And so uh, I, I'm always open to learning new things. So if you if you have any questions as you go through, uh, Christine asks, is there a way to catch up with the pat, with past images? I'm not sure what you mean by that. So if you'll let me know, I'll, uh, if you mean slides, this is only the, the, the third slide in the whole presentation. So you haven't missed much if you, uh, if you missed this. So anyway, efficiency and consistency. And by the way, this is being recorded. So if you have a glitch on your end or if I have a glitch on my end or whatever, uh, you'll be able to watch the rebroadcast and it should play without any glitches at all. So efficiency and consistency, finding a, a way to go through your images quickly. And then once you develop that workflow, doing the same thing over and over and over again, but until it becomes muscle memory. Okay. Christine means no tagging and organizing old images in Lightroom. Yeah. That's what I'm going to talk about today, Christine. Those are some of the strategies I'm going to share with you. And uh, and then Rob asked, do I use hard drives or SSD? I, I, that's what I'm going to get to right now, Rob, on my equipment. So I always like to talk about the equipment I use just because it's relevant to kind of my overall image management workflow. And so I, I use a 27 inch iMac is kind of my base computer at home. Uh, every two or three years, I try to buy a brand new computer. And the reason why is because they get faster processors in the image processing becomes faster and so since i'm working with such a big volume of images it helps me and it helps my my um, mental both my mental health and my attitude if i can just get through those pictures quicker and so and, and it doesn't seem like saving two or three seconds per process as much but when you add that up two or three seconds over a, a few thousand images a year tens of thousands of images a year that time really does add up and so I use a 27 inch iMac is kind of my base computer. I've got a laptop that's a, 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 a MacBook Pro laptop that I'm using now that I'll use some in the field. But when I'm looking at pictures to make my critical judgments, I prefer to look at them on the big screen. I use Adobe Lightroom Classic, like I said before. That's not the uh, only uh, that's not the only program to use. But it's the one I use because I've just adopted a long time ago. There's you can use Adobe Bridge. Uh, I think Photo Mechanic you can do the same things with. And uh, and so there's a number of different programs. I'm not familiar with all of them. 
And so this is one of the questions came in from Rob. Do you use hard drives or SSD? So the way my workflow eventually works, and I'll get into this in a little more detail, I import them first onto my computer, on my hard drive on my computer. And then when they kind of go to live in their final location where they live, uh, I've got a pro I use a product called Drobo. And uh, it Drobo uses the Drobos I have, you can put five hard drives in it of varying sizes and you it essentially what it does is it takes five drives and i'm not a real technical person it's like a raid system if you know what that is it takes five drives but the computer makes it think it's one drive so like on my drobo i've got at home it holds five drives i've got five three terabyte drives in that so five times three is 15 terabytes of storage space and then my computer thinks that that's one gigantic hard drive i can store it all on now, the advantage of Drobo that I've found, and again, knock on wood, I haven't had any trouble with this at all, but that Drobo creates a redundant backup on its, of itself. So if you have one hard drive go bad, excuse me, your data is still safe and it's still in there. All you got to do is pop out your one bad hard drive and then pop a new one back in and then it restores all your data. And while you're, it's restoring your data and while you've got a bad hard drive, the whole system doesn't go down you can still access your data. And so that's, uh, to answer Cheryl's question, that's the way I back up my images too. There's And, and I also use a, I don't really talk about it here, but since you asked the question, I've also got another set of backup. I've got, I've got I keep three sets of backups. One, Dro the Drobo drives is where my, my images uh, initially live. Number two, I've got a, another set of hard drives that I'll bring in to my office. And about, I try to do it quarterly, and about every quarter, I'll make a, an incremental backup of the new images to those drives. And then those drives go live somewhere else away from my house. So that way I've got a redundant backup somewhere else should things go bad. And then uh, the uh, the third thing I do is really, and I, I could go further than this, but the host of my website has unlimited storage. And I could theoretically store every image I have on there but I don't, I've kind of got the, the, the best 40 or 50,000 images that, that I think have a longer life other than just a, a longer uh, commercial or financial life other than just staying on my hard drive or on that side. So if my building that I keep my, my second backup burns down at the same time that my hard drives at home melts down, I'm not completely lost. I may have lost some images, but I've ultimately got that set of 50,000 images that live in the cloud. And then uh, she asked what company hosts your website. It's Photo Shelter is who I currently use, Cheryl. And then aside from that, you know, I, I say this all the time. I live, I've always lived in rural Texas and high-speed internet access hasn't always been a thing, but some sort of high-speed internet access is, is important, especially when I'm moving those pictures up on the cloud and just need, I'm move, moving full res JPEGs up on the cloud. So I need to, have fast upload speeds. In fact, one of the one of the things that I've done lately is worked with my internet service provider, where uh, I get a faster than normal upload speed because I, that's really download speeds are fine if you're going to stream videos or watch Netflix. Upload speeds are important if you're going to push pictures to the cloud. Uh, yeah, Christine says the the Drobo stores they they list all of them is sold out. I know I've been trying to buy a new one. And uh, I haven't been able to do that. So Brad and and, uh, and Cheryl both asked the question of who hosts my website. Again, it's a company called Photo Shelter. And it's just photoshelter.com is their, their website. So the high-speed internet works well for me just because it's, it allows me to uh, push images up into the cloud a lot more efficiently. And I've gotten where I'm starting to trickle even more images, especially some video clips and stuff like that that are valuable to me. So I've been putting more and more stuff up in the cloud. And then I've got a 15 inch MacBook Pro with Lightroom installed. Uh, I'm able to sync those catalogs. If I, if I, if like, if I'm on this trip now and I'll work on a few images while I'm on this Yellowstone trip, when I get home, I don't have to reinvent the wheel and redo my recipe. I can just sync those catalogs together and uh, it, I can move all my images from my, from my laptop to my desktop without much trouble at all. But I don't like to do that because my laptop is uh it's just kind of a viewing platform. I, I just don't like to look at images 
that close on it because the screen is is uh, relatively small compared to my other one. I like to be able to see the full image and be able to see it as much with as much detail as I can. And so that's my equipment. And so, uh, you know, we talked earlier about the concept of efficiency and consistency and efficiency really starts with the workflow. And again, this is my workflow. I'm not saying this is the best, again, uh, to repeat myself, I'm not saying this is the absolute best way to do it. This is just my way to do it. And it's worked out pretty well uh, for me over time. It's, it's, I haven't, I really, when I, when I was going from, from shooting film to digital, I knew digital was good, but one of the things that slowed me down in the transition is I wanted to be able to have, to be able to make sense, to be able to find my images because at that time I didn't have near the image collection I have now, but I still wanted to be able to, if I needed to find an image for a client or find an image for me or whatever. I just needed to develop some way to be able to go back and, and find those images relatively fast. And so a lot of my early days when I was making the transition to digital was really trying to develop in my mind what this workflow is, what process I'm, I'm going to build to be able to go through and, and download my images on the computer, go through them in a, in a, in sort of a repeatable sort of way and something that made sense. And then from once I, I got rid of the bad ones and kept the good ones. The next step is kind of how do I ultimately archive them and be able to find them. And so that, so the workflow I'm going to share with you kind of looks like this. It's a six step process for me. Uh, and each one of these processes, I'm going to list them in bullet form right now, but each one I'm going to go back and except for one, I'll go back and talk about in a little detail. And the one I, I'll tell you that I won't talk about much in detail because it's sort of a proprietary thing that, that I do it for a reason. And I'll tell you that reason in a minute. But my six step process is I download. And again, I'll go through each one of these a little more in detail. But if you want to take notes on these as we go through, then after I download, I do a quality edit. And then after that, after I do the quality edit, I rename all of my files. That's the one I won't go into big detail. And I'll tell you in a minute why, why I rename them. And then the fourth thing I do is I'll keyword some images, not all of them, but select images I'll apply keywords to. And then uh, I'll distribute the images and I'll tell you what that means in a little bit too. And then the last step in my six step process is I'll file them or put them where they're ultimately going to live the rest of their, their life. Uh, Christine says she uses Backblaze as a, as an overall backup solution. So, I'll, uh, I'll look up Backblaze and see what that looks like. So on this six-step process, the only one I'm not going to get into detail is the rename one. And here's the reason why. Back when back when I was transitioning to digital photography and really a lot of the commercial clients I deal with were transitioning, there it was sort of the Wild West. The magazines I would deal with or the commercial clients I would deal with, they didn't really have a good image management solution on their side. And... And you couldn't, and I don't mean this as an insult, but you couldn't, you couldn't automatic, automatically assume that the uh, people that were dealing with my images on the other end knew how to look at metadata or anywhere else I might embed my name into the, to the image or into the IPC data or wherever else. And so to get around that, so there would be no question of whose picture it belonged to. I just got in the habit of renaming my pictures right after I did my quality edit. So in other words, I'll go through and delete the ones that are bad and the ones I keep that will ultimately get filed and go to step six. I rename everything and I'll show you in a, in a minute what it looks like. But essentially my renaming process, I put my last name and then a number after that. Uh, I put my last name in and a number after that. The number really means nothing. It's just a sequential numbering system I use. But what the reason why I rename it is if that image, like this Coyote image here, if it goes, sits at a magazine somewhere in New York City and they're going to use it, I don't want it. When they look at the file name, they'll know exactly who it belongs to without them having to uh, go through and figure out who it belongs to. Because in the early days, I used to get emails all the time when these editors would send out this, this thumbnail of an image and say, hey, we want to use this image, but we don't know who it belongs to. Can anybody tell us? They'd send it out to hundreds of photographers. And so by renaming, I just wanted to get around that. So all these steps, five steps are really important, I think. 
that renaming is important for me, but it may not be important for you. And then Christine asked the question, I'd like to hear if you keep the original image number with any renaming though. Uh, no, I don't keep the original image number. I just give it a new number and give it a new name. And so let's talk about each one of those individually. So download, I'm going to skip that because downloads are pretty, it's a pretty specific process depending on what program you use. In Lightroom, when I download images, I just pretty much download everything at one time. I don't key, I don't apply keywords when I download because there may be pictures of coyotes on there. There may be pictures of deer, maybe a bunch of different pictures of different things on the same card. So I don't apply any keywords when I download. I just download the images. The only thing I do apply to it is you can adjust that. And towards the end of the webinar, when I switch over to, to Lightroom, I can show you how to do that. But when you import images, you can actually apply a, uh, a, a, a metadata preset. And what I do is every time I download the images, I apply my name, address, and all my contact information into the metadata. So it's, it's there uh, for long-term use and it, it, it helps in a variety of ways. And so, but so once I download and however you download, the first big step I do is the quality edit. And so the first edit, as I go through the pictures, I'm, I'm looking for the basics. I'm looking for, is exposure good? Is it within kind of the realm of I can fix, you know, because as much as I like to think I can get exposure right every time, the truth is I can't. And so I'll go through the whole edit. And uh, if, if, if the exposure is close, I'll keep it. If it's not, if I can't save it at all, I'll just delete it. On Lightroom, I hit the key X to, to mark it for deletion. Uh, and then I kind of look for composition. I really, I really do try to compose the images properly in the camera without having to just default to, to, uh, to cropping all the time. Because again, my thought is being efficient and efficient doesn't mean having to work on this images, uh, for a minute or two each image that I want to keep. I'm just trying to get them as perfect as I can in the camera so that that way when I when I get them on the computer, I'm just not having to languish over individual images for a long time. Now, my business is different. And, you know, I'm not, my business is a, it's like a factory. I'm, I'm going to go out and produce a lot of images. I'm going to, I'm going to go out and, uh, and, and these images I produce, will be not only have a, a, an immediate life, let's say I'm doing a photo assignment for a magazine and I may shoot the pictures for them. And uh, I may shoot the pictures for them, but a lot of the pictures I take for a magazine may have a future life as stock photography through me because I represent uh, my own, primarily my, I represent my own work primarily. I've got a couple of other agents who represent me. And so I, it, the less time I can spend on each image for me, the better. And so I try to get it right. So I'm looking for exposure, composition. If I got it a little bit off, can I fix the composition? And then really looking, is it in focus or not? And if it's purposely out of focus, I'll keep it. But if it's not out of focus, I just delete them. And again, I on using Lightroom, I hit X when I go through them and, and just get rid of the images that just don't look good, uh, that don't pass that first basic quality edit. And I tell people this a lot because I'll have people telling me that they don't delete anything and they have a hard time deleting images. It sounds pretty simple for me to say this, but I tell people a lot, don't fall in love with your images because they won't love you back. I mean, if it's uh, you know, hard drive space is cheap, I just delete it because I delete them because there's no point in having to wade through bad images just to find the good ones. So that's another part of efficiency is when you delete the bad ones and just get rid of them forever. They're not taking up space on your hard drive and they're not taking up real estate space on your screen. So you're not having to wade through a bunch of the bad ones to get to the good ones. Uh, Rob asked, do I have the camera put the copyright on the photos? I, Rob, no, I have the, uh, I use Lightroom that applies it. It doesn't put it on the photos. I don't ever tag my pictures on the photos with the copyright, but it does put it embedded in the metadata that you can't see it. But if you wade through and look at the metadata, you can see my copyright uh statement and it's all embedded inside the picture and so the second edit i go back and do and again i'll show you these techniques in a minute is where i pick the images from my website blog facebook or whatever else I'm, i plan to share share them and really what i do using lightroom is i'll give it a color tag uh when i'm going through lightroom 
going through my edit, I'll have one, I'll have one finger on the X to delete it, one finger on the number six, and that gives it a red color tag. That's the first color tag I start with. And then I use an, another finger on the on the right button just to go to the next picture. And so by keeping my thumb on X and my middle finger on six and then my, my right hand, my forefinger on the on the right arrow button, I can generally go through and do an edit pretty quick on a bunch of pictures. Because all I'm doing is I'm looking for these basic things. Does it does it fit the basics? Is it exposure good? Is the composition good? Is the focus good? And I'm making a split second decision on these pictures. And the ones I think are good enough to keep. And sometimes I'll go back through and take a second look at them. But the ones, the ones that I think on the second edit that I think are worthy of taking another look at, I'll give them a number six. And some people will say, well, why don't you give it a, on Lightroom? You can hit one through five and give it a, a star value. And the reason why I don't do stars, and I'll show you that in a minute. Because so, so again, to reiterate, I'm going to show you this presentation first. And because it looks like we may have some issues with bandwidth, I'm going to not switch back and forth between this and Lightroom. So a lot of this stuff, it, after I go through the presentation, I'll actually get on Lightroom and show you how I do it. And the reason why I do colors instead of stars is when I'm scrolling through a bunch of images, I can just see the colors quicker than I can see the stars on the image. Uh, Michael asked, uh, yeah, Michael, I will. I, I knew I saw you when you came in here and I meant to respond to you earlier. Good to see you, buddy. And uh, tell, tell Kip I said hello. And so the next step, which I talked about this, I'll go through this a little bit. Uh, there's an example of how I rename my images. Again, the number doesn't mean anything. It's just a sequential number that I use, but I always put my last name in it. So it's Graves Dash. And Lightroom allows you to go through and pick a bunch of images at one time. You can rename a million images if you want to. Uh, but I just, whatever the keeper images is, after I've deleted the bad ones, I'll go back and rename all the pictures, uh, that sequential number. And so this is where the rubber meets starts meeting the road. You know, the, the being able to find your images and manage, manage them all really has to do with, you know, we, we eliminated the bad ones so we don't have to wade through them first. And then the, the renaming really doesn't amount to much on finding images. But this is where this is where it really starts getting helpful. So to give you a little bit of a preview, I can find my images really fast. And again, 620,000 of them. I can find them really fast by doing some basic things. One is I use keyword, two, I use colors, and three, I use the, the folders and how I organize things will allow me to go through and find any image I've got pretty quick. Uh, and so keywording is where I embed words into the images that are searchable in Lightroom. Uh, is, uh, and, and uh, searchable in Lightroom and, and then also my website. And so one of the things I did when I was really trying to figure out my digital workflow was I started studying how people search for images. And what I found out is most people search for images in a pretty basic sort of way. They may go to a website and they, they may not take, you know, they may not type in like on my website and I, and I can, I can, I can't tell who's searching, but I can log, I log keywords on my website and I know how people search for my images. And so what I found out is people aren't going on there and searching for like, you know, picture of an albino white-tailed deer in, in, uh, in Buffalo Burr, you know, they're, they're looking for simple terms like albino deer. And so that's why I usually keep my keywords pretty simple. Uh, Lisa asked, does keywording work in Adobe Bridge? It does. Yeah, that's, that's where I started keywording my, my pictures before there was a lot room as I used Adobe Bridge. And so I usually keep my keywords pretty simple. So like in this picture, in this example, here's what my keywords look like in that exact image on my site. They, it's, they've got the words quail, bobwhite. Now here's the thing, a lot of times if there's a misspelled word or if there's a, if someone may not put, technically bobwhite is one word, but they may put bobwhite as two words. So I'll give it, I'll put bob and white. It's a bird. It's an upland bird. It's on a fence. There's a post and there's a fence post. Probably if I was going to add one or two more, I might add wire or barbed wire. But anyway, so I found out when people search my for my uh, for images on my website, they may just go and put Bob White in there. And so when I so when I search for my images using Lightroom or using Bridge, 
I can type in the same keywords and find the same images as I could on my website or as anybody else can on my website. So if you'll notice this too, here's another tip. Each one of those words is separated by a comma except for Bob and White. And, and the reason why is almost all of these, and, and, and maybe with that exception, I don't know that for sure, so I don't want to say that for sure, but almost all of these photo databases like Lightroom, like Bridge, like Photo Shelter's website, like Smug Mug's website that uses keywords to help you find your photos in order to differentiate the words, you've got to put a comma between each word to differentiate. And I'll show you some strategies in a minute on how to go through and, and, uh, and, and keyword pretty quickly. It's a, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of take you through a quick, quick example of my, of my workflow that we're talking about here. Brad asked a question. When I switch photos in Lightroom, it takes a few seconds for the next photo, photo for the next photo to load fully. Is this a Lightroom thing or my internet connection? It, Okay, so it depends on which version of Lightroom you're using. If you're using uh, the Lightroom Creative Cloud, it may be your internet connection. But if it's a Lightroom Classic version, it's most likely the, your computer and just the inability to process it that fast, Brad. Because uh, when you use Lightroom Classic, all of those images live all those images live locally within your own system. You can unplug the internet, and the whole system will still work. So it depends on which version that you're using and the next step i do after that is i file it so this is where i'm taking the images and telling them where they're going to live forever and uh this is where i dif differ from a lot of people and again i'm not saying my way is the best way in the absolute way it's just my way but i use a subject-based filing system i have a lot of people tell me well i file mine by date and here's why I don't file mine by date. I think it's a little bit redundant. I think it's a little bit redundant because you're, the time and date is already embedded into the image. So I don't need to, I don't need to be able to put that in my filing system, be able to find the images. Plus, I take lots of pictures, and I think a lot of you guys probably take a lot of pictures. And I think once it gets kind of stale in your mind, I mean, I don't, I can't, I can look at this picture here and I know where it was taken. I, but I can't for the life of me, this picture was taken along Soda Butte Creek in Yellowstone National Park, but I can't for the life of me remember, was it taken in, in May? And if it was, or was it taken in September? Or if it was taken in May, what year was it? I have no clue what year it was. Uh, but if I use a subject-based filing system, I can go and, and find that image a lot quicker than trying to sit there and think of the dates. And so uh, me personally, some people may have it. I can remember kind of approximate dates, but I can't remember exact dates. And so that's why I file them by dates don't matter to me. This may be a little bit hard to see, but if you look on the left there, you'll see that there's kind of a hierarchy of folders. Uh, in this particular one I've got highlighted, it's uh, I've got a folder that I call mammals. And, with, and it tells you how many images were within that folder. And uh, I've got my screen pretty small so I can see all the stuff I've got going on here. But, you know, I don't know what that number says. I, like I said, I don't have my, my presentation full screen here. But let's say it says 50,000. So that's telling me I got 50,000 pictures of mammals in that folder. And so within that folder, you can see here, I'll start breaking them down into different subjects. And so, you know, in this particular one, Bighorn Sheep, it's got, I, again, I can't see that number because it's pretty small on my screen, but it's got, you know, maybe it says it says 500 or whatever. And so all of a sudden that if you can kind of see how I'm working, I'm using keywords and colors and my filing system and the metadata to some degree to, I'm still looking for a needle in a haystack, but all of a sudden I'm, be able, I'm able to make these haystacks a lot smaller. So now instead of having to use this file based system in my mind, instead of having to search through 620,000 images, if I call my wife and say, I need to find a picture of a bighorn sheep, she can go into my mammals folder, find my bighorn sheep folder, and then she can be able to, instead of looking through 620,000 images, now all she has to do is look through, say, 500 images to find it. So again, still looking for a needle in a haystack, but that haystack just got a lot smaller. And then when I start applying those things like colors and keywords to the mix, then instead of 500 pictures she's looking through, maybe we're only searching through 20 or 30 at the end. 
And so by, by using the different tools you have available to you or I have available to me in Lightroom, I can just narrow that funnel down to the point where it makes finding just about any image I have a whole lot easier. And so, uh, and that takes me to my last step, which is distribution. And this is really doesn't apply to the workflow, but ultimately what I do is, is I distribute my images in a different, in a lot of different ways. And this is, I get this question a lot. So that's why I included this folder on there. Uh, I, I manage my, I, I send my images through multiple distribution channels. Uh, I've got a, I've got a blog on my website that feeds. And actually when I do my blog, it actually feeds Facebook and Instagram and all that. And here lately, I haven't been very good at posting stuff on social media. Uh, there's times of the year when I get busy with other stuff and I just want to take a break from all that. So social media gets exhausting to me from, uh, from time to time because of all the, uh, uh, I like living in a happy world and surrounding myself with happy and pretty things. And sometimes it gets pretty ugly on social media. So I like to stay away from it. And then I've got, aside from my, I, I represent myself. So I've got my own photo agency called russellgraves.com, but I'm also represented by two other photo agencies that represent some of my work. Uh, one in agriculture, one in hunting and fishing and outdoor stuff that I do. And then, uh, Again, I said my website, and that's where most of the images end up at are on my website that I go through and find these. And then uh, I produce a variety of marketing pieces for the professional work that I do. And then I'll send direct emails to uh, to clients and just, oops, and then just uh, show them kind of what I've been working on here lately. And before I transition, let me look catch up on the questions right quick uh brad said he uses classic lightroom classic but online and i'm not sure i'm not sure what you mean by that brad uh because it's i'm I, i'm guessing you keep your images online that's what I, I don't know so you might you might uh clarify that a little bit and then christine says do i use the photo shelter website platform i do use it and so they, that kind of works as my, my, my forward facing part. And then I pretty use their, their uh, back end pretty robustly for kind of helping me manage my images. So between my computer and my website is kind of my image management sort of, sort of platform where I can, you know, the, the, the website and the back end of my website really helps me when I'm away from my main library, being able to kind of figure out where images are. And then if I need to call my wife and I'm going to have to this week at some point, call her and get her to find a couple of images for me that she can get uploaded for a client for me. But yeah, I use photo shelters website platform. So before we, I switch screens and uh, we try this experiment of on you, on me showing you Lightroom. Are there any questions so far or any more questions on the, on the workflow or anything else? And I'll tell you this, one of the things that you've got to be aware of is that workflow, it really does work. You can adapt the different parts for yourself, but really that, that workflow is designed to be efficient and make the process efficient. But without the second part of that key that I told you earlier, it never works. And that's consistency. If, if I think everybody in here knows, including me, like right now, I've got 16,000 images waiting on my computer at home for me to go do something with. And so I've got the efficiency built in, but the one thing I've lacked in December and January is the consistency to go back and, 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 and do all the things I need to do to get them into the system. And so without the consistency part, the efficiency does me no good and it'll do you no good. So I encourage you, once you develop your workflow, to, to be consistent and do it over and over and over again and be, you know, it's like anything else. If you let it, if you let your checkbook slide, when people used to use checkbooks, if you went a couple of months without balancing your checkbook, it became a monster. And so I try to stay on top of that monster all the time. I don't do as good a job uh, on it, but as, or I don't do a good, as good a job on staying consistent sometimes, but I really make an effort to do it. And so uh, the, uh, uh, oh, I was reading a couple of questions, so I lost my train of thought. But anyway, but I'll tell you this, whether you've got 100 pictures you need to go through or 16,000 like I've got to go through or 100,000 to go through, 
my best advice is to go through and chip away a little at a time. Pick it, make a goal, go through a thousand a night. With this system that I do, I can literally go through. I can go through a thousand pictures an hour and be able to go through them and just just decide if I'm going to keep them or not, and then put them through the process. A thousand pictures an hour, so or at least. Uh, and so what I'll do when I get home is I'll just probably commit about an hour a day, hour or two a day to go through them. No, I can do more than that. A thousand pictures an hour. I can probably do. I can probably do a couple thousand pictures an hour uh, and go through them. That's how quick the process is. Uh, so I've got a few more questions coming in here before I transition. Lee says, how do you find pictures using keywords? I'm going to show you that when I switch screens, Lee. So bear with me on this one. Uh, Rob asks, best way to find and go through pictures. Go Wait, I don't understand the question. You might reword that, Rob. I'm not sure what you're asking there. And uh, and Lee, stay with me, Lee. I'll ask that question again. And Lisa says, do you ever need dates? Can you search metadata once you find the images you want? Yeah, I'm going to show you how to do that too as soon as I switch screens. I do use dates, uh, Lisa. I just don't catalog them by dates. And then I've got another question here. Uh, Peter asked if I'm tagging only raw data here or processed images in other formats too. So I'll I'll tag my raw files and that will live with the, uh, as long as you tell Lightroom to do it, those keywords will live with any other, uh, if you do a JPEG or a TIFF or any other format you output them to, that data will stay with the images as long as you tell it to. Uh, let's see. Rob says he's not seeing others questions. Yeah, Rob, I can only see the questions. So, uh, they are, uh, they're not supposed to be visible. And then Lisa says, do you only keep your five stars and does it depend on where you shoot locale delete far off keep? I'm not sure what the last part of that means, but I don't usually use the stars, Lisa. I use colors. And when I switch, I'll show you why. Uh, and then Christine asked, do I download directly from my camera? So I've got a Canon R5 and I do download directly from that one. And the reason why is I don't have a card reader for that, for those CF Express cards yet. But the rest of them, I've got a, uh, I've got a Lexar card reader that holds four different cards. And so I can put four cards in it and download them all at one time. So I do both. Uh, so I don't really have any, I don't have any, any problems with any of that. So I'm not sure what your problems you describe are. So keep asking questions as I go along. I, let me throw that in there right quick. If you want to take a note on this, if we get done with this and you start kind of wading through things and forget something I said, again, this will be, this is being recorded. You'll get a link with the rebroadcast of it. You can go back through it again. But if you have any specific questions after we get done, feel free to reach out to me. Sometimes I may be a day or two slow on getting back to you, but I'll always respond to your email. So feel free to contact me with that. If you, if you, uh, if you have any other questions after this is over. So I'm going to turn this part off, make my screen go blank, switch screen. So stay with me for a second. I'm going to be right back on here. So your screen might have went blank there. So I'm going to start up this next thing and get it going. So again, bear with me while your screen goes blank. When I was a kid, I used to justify... Like, I mean, when I was a little kid, like three or four years old, I remember having thoughts of going down the road and seeing like a street light, and wondering how that works. And so my impression was it must have like monkeys inside of it, changing the lights from red to green. And so uh, whenever I'm describing something working in the background, it's I'm always still always still talk about putting my monkeys to work. And so while my monkeys are working in the background, loading up Lightroom, uh, Again, your screen should go blank. So I think we've got it loaded now. I'm going to get this window shared. When I share this window, let me know if you can see it. It may take a second to come up. I see from here it's loading, so just give it a second. We should be good. Okay, let me know if you can see it on your screen. 
should be able to. I'll wait for a second. Okay. All right. People can see it. Now, here's what I don't understand about, about, uh, I don't, I don't know this answer here. Something about this platform we use, this big marker platform we use to do the, the webinars. It won't, it doesn't show the side panels on, on Lightroom. It just shows the middle panel. And I'm not sure why it does that, even though I can see the side panels from my end. So essentially what I do is when I download images, they're just in the library folder like they are right now. I mean, they're, you know, I can look at the loop view and see a bunch of images. And really all I'm doing is going through and on that first edit we talked about is going through them and, uh, and picking out the images I like, the images I don't like. I, I hit X if it's an image I don't like. I hit the number six if it's a keeper that I think I kind of need to look at again. And so those are really the first pass. Those are the first two things I do is I will, you know, I may start on this one and I'll go to the next one and I'll go to the next one. And if I like that one, I may hit a six and I gave it a little red label. You can see there all of a sudden it turns a red label. And if I don't like that one, I may hit an X. Now these pictures you're seeing now, they're not poorly composed. Those are just the series that I use to put together that panoramic shot that's at the top. And so that's really the first thing I'll do. I'll just go through and, and, and go from one picture to the next. It's a pretty quick process. And I'll just decide, make a snap judgment. Does it, does it pass the muster? And if it does, I keep it. If it doesn't, I hit an X and then, uh, and then if if it if it I think it's worth looking at again, I'll hit the six. So Sandra asked the question, what is X? On Lightroom, X will, I'll do it here and you I think you'll see it pop up. Nope, no, nope, it, it doesn't. X sets the picture as rejected. That means I don't like it if it hit X. And you can go back in Lightroom later on and and uh and delete all your rejected pictures in bulk at one time. And so X. We'll, we'll set the pictures rejected. And then number six, all that will do is, if you can see here, it'll give it a color. Someone asked, where's the library pane? I, I, don't, I don't know why you can't see it on this screen because something in the way this translates uh, over through Big Marker, it, I don't know why it doesn't, sh that, that you can't see that there. And so the first pass, that's what I do. I just use a, I use a six. To, to select the images, not that I ultimately want to keep, but the ones that maybe want to look at again. And I use the X to delete the ones that I don't like. Now, with that said, I'm going to go down. And the reason, if, as I scroll these through, through these things, uh, as I scroll through these things, you know, fairly quickly, one of the, I'm going to scroll through to where I know I've got some mark. One of the reasons I don't use stars and I use colors to mark them instead is because when I'm scrolling through these pictures, I can't see stars very quick. To see stars, I've got to stop and let it kind of render out. But I can see colors. They show up immediately. And so that's why I don't like using stars. Instead, I use colors. And so one of the things I can do, and I don't think you can see this on your screen. Oh, well, yeah, you can. So I can... Once I've gone through and I've hit all my pictures that I, that I that I think are my better ones, the, the ones I marked red, I can hit attribute on Lightroom and then I can select this button right here and I can tell Lightroom to show me all the pictures that are red. So now instead of looking through 8,800 pictures that are in this, uh, I'm sorry, instead of looking through, yeah, 8,700 pictures that are in this folder I have right here, I can only look through the ones I've marked red. And so now, like I, the, the, the analogy I used before, now instead of looking through a, a needle in a haystack, I'm still looking for a needle in a haystack, but all of a sudden now I made my haystack 16 images and I made it a lot smaller. And so from a row image management standpoint, let's say these are all the ones I think are keepers that I want to I want to put on my website. Uh, okay, so Leanne asked the question, at what point do you remove or change the red color? I never remove it. I always leave it on there because that's future reference for me. Because I can go to my wife, for example, and I use my wife because she's kind of helps me out a lot. 
I can call her and say, uh, you know, just make me a JPEG of all the red images in the black bears folder, for example, and she can do that. It may be a hundred images. And so from there I can change it. The one thing I will add an, an additional layer of color is this. So let's say I, I, these are all the ones that, that I went through on my first edit, the red ones. And I thought these are kind of, these are good enough for me to really kind of consider a lot of pictures I keep. I don't put labels on a lot of pictures. I'll keep just to have it as a backup of an, of a, of one of my better pictures. Cause when I shoot wildlife, I, uh, for example, I'll shoot a lot of pictures of the same, same scene and same pose. And so I, I'll keep a few redundant ones just to have them. But the ones I've got labeled red, a lot of times what I'll do is, is go in and enlarge them and take a better look at them. And at that point, I'm only using two buttons when I'm doing kind of my second edit of my keepers. And that is I'm trying to decide which ones I want to put on my, on my website. And so from all the red ones I'm looking at, the kind of the finalist, I may look at that one and think, you know, that's a pretty good shot. And then the two buttons I'm using in is I'm using, a, oops, I'm using nine because that's, we'll set a blue color label and I'm using, I only have to use the right button because once I label it nine, it disappears from this look at it. And so I'll go through and I'll just find the pictures I think belong on my website and I'll label them a different color red. And so now the ultimate keepers, if you look, because I've told in the attribute panel, I've told Lightroom to show me all the images I have labeled red. Well, those, those keepers aren't in there anymore. But now if I tell them to show me the ones labeled blue, there they are. So just using color labels, I've taken this process from having to look at 500 pictures of bears to really I'm, I'm, I'm looking at my best 16 and from my best 16, I'm making the decision. What's my best three or four. And so my best three or four are going to show up blue in there. So I can use these, you can do the same thing with stars, but again, the reason why I use color labels instead of uh, stars is when you're looking at all the pictures is I'm scrolling through them pretty quick. It just, it just all of a sudden allows me to see those colors kind of pop out. And I can find when I'm just scrolling through, I can find them quicker by looking at color labels as opposed to the, the stars. So now I can do a couple things. I can use the Lightroom, using the attribute mode. I can say again, show me all the colors that are that are uh, blue. It'll show me the blue ones. And this is where we're going to struggle just a little bit. Now in the library mode, once you picked an image, you, it's got a keywording, uh, it's got a keywording module. You can add, add keywords to individual pictures. But let me see if this works real quick. I'm gonna quick click. There's a software program that I'm gonna tell you right now that works great with Lightroom. It's a plugin. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select all these pictures I've got, the three blue ones I want to keep. And then I'm going to use, there's a, I'm going to see if this shows up. There's a, using my plugins under the file menu in Lightroom, I'm going to, I'm, I use a, a plugin called My Keyworder for Lightroom. And I'm going to tag the images as a batch. And I don't. I don't. I don't know that that's going to show up. And like I said, I don't know. I don't understand why. Let me pause for a second and make, see if I can make a change to a setting. Here, I'm going to do this. I'm going to change the setting right quick and just show you my entire screen instead of a window. And tell me if. Tell me if this works. You're going to get to see the back end of this uh, webinar software program I use, so I can double check it. Okay, I'm gonna. You should be able to see it now. I'm just going to. I'm going to delete that and just work strictly on Lightroom. So if you got questions coming through, I'm kind of blind to the questions right now. I can't see them, so you'll have to bear with me for a second. But I'm going to go back to this, and you should be able to see my entire screen now instead of me just sharing a window. But 
on the black bear images that I've labeled blue, which again, I've determined are my ultimate keepers. If you look over here on the right, you see the keywords already added bear, black, black bear, forest, mammal, nature, outdoors. It's got the scientific name. I found people don't search for scientific names because quick name an animal, you know, the scientific name too. I can't tell you very many that I know the scientific name too, but just different keywords I've got on there. And, and I'll show you how we, how we find our images using keywords in just a minute, Lee. But I can select all these images and I'm going to go to file and plug in extras. And I'm going to use this, my keyworder for Lightroom plugin and tag my images as a batch. And so what's cool about this is it, it really kind of takes some of the thinking out of it. Now I've already got keywords added to these, but I can type in black bear in the search box here and I can search keywords. And then this plugin will give me all the keywords it thinks would fit on these image on the black bear images once I search for black bear. So I can go through here and I can select the images I want. I'm just going to add a couple more to it. I'm going to add fur and predator and let me see what else I can add. Fauna, portrait, I'll just add these. And so I can select just the keywords I want and then I can add them to my list over on the right. It just automatically adds the keywords to my list. And then I can click here, save keywords to photos. And it's gonna automatically, whether I've got three selected like I have now or whether I've got 500 selected, it'll add those keywords to the, uh, to the images. So you can see now over here on the right, under the keywording panel, each one of those images are tagged. So Lee asked the question earlier about uh, how do you find images using keywords? So in, in Lightroom, you can go here to text, for example. I'm going to turn off attributes. So it's got all the images I have in this folder right now. I can go to text. And now, because I've got keywords added, I can say, I want to look at all the black bear images I have. And then all of a sudden, it shows me all the black bear images I have in my catalog. And it's got 16 or 14 of those, 14 out of 8,700 pictures. So again, making that haystack smaller that I, I'm having to look for those images. And so from there, I can say, well, show me the images, for example, I'm going to look at the metadata and show me the images on the metadata that I took on Friday. I want to see those. And then all of a sudden there, it's showing me the pictures I took on Friday, April 23rd. And it's got my camera make and it's got the model, the lens I used, and it's got all that stuff. Or if I didn't want to use the metadata to search, I can again say, of all the black bear pictures, I've got blue pick. Show me my, my absolute best ones. And, and then all of a sudden I click the blue label, show me the blue ones and it shows me the best ones. And so that it's just using that system, using a combination of, of the label of the color labels, the keywording, and then the, uh, and then the, uh, uh, the filing to be able to find your images. Cause if you look over here on the right and this, I showed you this on the slideshow, I've just got, this is, this is kind of a working folder. This isn't exactly how I do it back at home. This is just showing examples, but here I've got all these pictures in a folder. I named Wyoming for some reason one time, but I've got a folder called black bear, horse, pronghorn and wolf. So I've got all these pictures sort of, I've got these different pictures categorized so I can click on the bear folder and find all my bear pictures. I can click on the horse folder and I can find all the pictures of horses I've got and I can pick pronghorn and look at pronghorn pictures so i'm able to kind of go through and using folders colors keywords and be able to narrow down pictures really quick and if i need to go more finite than that i can click on metadata and just dig through the lens i used, the camera i used the date it was taken on any number of things and that system and doing it consistently you, you can find the images really quick so with that said i am going to I'm going to 
switch back over to showing a window. Oh. I don't know why that is. Okay. I, I apologize for that. I don't know why it was showing the Safari screen. And I couldn't see your questions or as they were as they were uh popping up. I'm gonna go back through and ask a few more questions. Again, I don't know why why uh this big marker doesn't show uh I does I don't know why this big marker doesn't show the whole Lightroom screen when you see it. Uh Okay, some people said there it is. Let me back up a little bit because I know I got a lot of questions going on uh, that came through here. Let me make sure I answer them. Christine asked, do you have to answer a question about removing permanently for each picture? No, you can do it in bulk. You can go to, if you go up to uh, on Lightroom, click on photo and then click on uh, remove images, it will show you, it'll ask if you want to delete all the rejected photos. It, and it's going to ask you, do you want to remove them from the catalog or remove them from the computer? I usually, if they're, if they're rejected, I'll remove them from the computer. Uh, so you can do that in bulk. And then Christine asked, is the six a Mac thing or a Lightroom thing? It's Lightroom. Uh, I think it works the same on PC or Mac, but six is the is the Lightroom number for being able to uh, to mark the picture. And then how does six mark the picture? Well, using Lightroom again, this is a Lightroom specific number you use. Kathy asked this question. Uh, six is the is what the shortcut is to label the image of the color red in Lightroom. So it just marks it on the uh, image on in within Lightroom and that's how you can find them quicker. And then Rob asks, what are your keeper files? I keep the raw files. Uh, the JPEGs, I usually just L export them temporarily and then into a folder on my desktop. And then when I send them wherever they need to go, I'll delete that folder. So the, my keepers are raws. Uh, and then Marvin says the information not displaying. I apologize for that. Uh, and then Bob asked when performing a quality edit, would setting the cap lock on the keyboard be an option to auto advance to the images? Uh, yeah, I think it would. I've never thought about that, Bob. I'm going to try that. That might be, and that'll save a finger if it'll auto advance. So I never thought about that before. So see, I'll learn something new all the time too. That's interesting. I'm going to, I'm going to try that because that would at least, uh, save one step. And then Rob says the program is called My Keyworder is My Keyworder for Lightroom is what it's called, Rob. Uh, so that that's what it's called, and that I've found that it helps speed up the keywording process immensely. I can just go through and keyword a lot of pictures pretty quick. And so Cheryl asked, please answer my question above. I don't Cheryl, if you could ask that question again, I don't. I don't see it. I might have I might have accidentally deleted it or got lost in the shuffle somehow. So if you'll if you'll ask that question again, uh, I would appreciate it. Oh, okay, I see it now. About how to move images from an old to a new computer that includes all the edits made. Uh, if if you can contact me offline, I can show you how to do that. In fact, I think I've got a a uh, a, a little short video made I can share with you on that. I think, but essentially what you do is you have to go into Lightroom into the file and then you you have to export your entire image collection as a catalog on your old computer and then you uh, on your new computer you import that catalog and just merge it with your existing catalog and you and you ought to be able to uh, you ought to be able to take all those old edits on the old computer bring them into a new computer without having to go redo everything and it's it's pretty easy to do I mean it takes just a few seconds so uh, I think that's it. So yeah, if you can, if you can send me an email, I, I'll find that video and I think I've done it before. I'll show you how to do it. I think I did it for someone else. So if I, if I say someone else's name on it, it's the same information you're asking right now, but 
look in Lightroom and look as look at on your old computer. Look at that. This says export as a catalog. You can export all your recipes as a catalog. You might have to physically move your images to the new computer, but you can import that catalog because Lightroom. You got to remember the images don't live inside a Lightroom. They live somewhere else. Lightroom just references the address. A good analogy I know to use is. Lightroom works like, remember the old school phone books that we all used to have? Lightroom works like that. So in other words, you can look in Lightroom and find my address and find my phone number and find the information about me, but I don't live inside the, uh, the phone book. I live in an address. All that phone book does is reference where I live, and that's the same Lightroom work. So you're going to have to move the images, but you can do all the settings to, that you've used in Lightroom and export them as a catalog and import them in the next catalog. Sharon asked, Lightroom regularly updates their catalog and gives them new names. Can I delete the old ones? Uh, you can, Sharon. I've done it before, but you just need to make really, really careful that you delete the right one. So just double, triple check. So uh, technically you can, but you just need to make sure that you, you understand what you're doing and the ramifications if you get it wrong. So And the ramifications if you get it wrong doesn't delete your images it just deletes the reference to your images and if you listen to the to the phone book reference i just made it just you burn your phone book and you got to go rebuild it so again lightroom just references images where they live somewhere else the images don't live in there so you, it's uh you can get rid of all the catalogs you want but as you'll just have to go back and rebuild them it's just going to take more work Well, I don't see any more questions coming in, and we're about 12 minutes past time. This is supposed to be over. Uh, number one, apologize for the technical glitches in the beginning, and and uh, and uh, I appreciate you sticking with me on that. It's you know when you deal with technology, it sometimes has a mind of its own, and you never know what it's going to happen. What it's going to what's going to happen with it. Uh, number two, if if I didn't make myself clear on something, or you you need help with something that I talked about today, feel free to reach out uh, Russell at russellgraves.com. Ask me the question. I'll be happy to answer and happy to help you in any way I can and, uh, and help, help you keep moving forward. Again, don't, don't feel daunted. I mean, we've all been there before. You got a lot of images. It's like, it seems like a mountain to overcome, but you know, you can climb, you can climb any mountain you want to climb. You just got to take the first step and just develop that workflow and just develop the habit of just doing it every time. And it won't get away from you. The uh, the the ultimate thing is is uh, is just do it and be consistent with it each and every time. And, and you can you can find images. I mean, I'm I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I can tell you by just being developing that workflow I shared with you today and being consistent with it and just doing it on a regular basis to manage my images, I can go through and find images that I took 20 years ago and find them within seconds. And it just takes no time at all. So I encourage you to do that again. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions for me. Uh, always glad to help. Thank you, everybody that listened in. And, uh, and uh, I'll talk to you soon. Take care, everybody.